Alrighty, it's time for some AI stuff. Relatively simple AI stuff. We're going to make a three-state AI. Patrolling, chasing, and attacking. I have uh, put in the Nathmash on my testing plane here. We're going to be using this placeholder enemy for the time being. Once this works, I will get started on some more character modeling and stuff like that. But that's for later videos. So we're going to make this into a separate script from the enemy script because the enemy script is going to be used by everything up to like bosses and stuff like that. This is specifically for patrolling enemies, which will be most enemies, but not all of them. So we're making new scripts, patrol enemy. So first things first, we're going to need to be using unity engine.ai because we're going to be using AI. With that, obviously, a navmesh agent, which we'll just call navmesh agent. It's a pretty long name. Let's just call it agent, why not? Game object player. We're probably going to mostly be using that for a transform position, honestly, but maybe we can use it for, uh, for some other script stuff as well. And then something I haven't worked with before is layer masks. I did look at a couple tutorials for this and I found one that used layer masks and I was like, okay, that's a really good opportunity for me to learn to use something new. One will be called ground and one will be called player. And of course, we already have something called player. So we're going to call this uh, ground layer. And just to be consistent with the naming schemes, we're going to change these to being lowercase. And then we're going to call this uh, player layer. So then for the patrol variables, we're going to want a vector three as destination point. So that's the point we're going to be walking towards. Uh, and a ball to check um, is at destination. And then we're probably also going to want a float for walk range. Because we don't want them to be able to walk all over the nav match, probably just pick a point within a certain range and walk to that. I also realized that the code is looking uh, particularly small today. And that's because I was uh, coding without having the recording going before. And I like having a lot of it on screen, but it's not good for recording. So here you go. You can read now. Then for the attacking state, we're going to want a float for time between attacks because otherwise he'll be constantly attacking. Then another float for attack timer, which will count up towards this. And then bool for can attack. And then we need a couple of more things to know for the state changes, which is the side range and the attack range. And corresponding to that, we're also going to need to know whether or not players inside those ranges using bulls. So that's player in sight and player in attack. Player equals game object dot find. And the name we have for that is just player. So this way, every enemy that spawns automatically looks for the player rather than us having to assign it, especially if we're going to be spawning in enemies which eventually is something that i want to do is enemies are going to be prefabs and they're going to be instantiated in through spawner so that i can have multiple waves of enemies i just put down a spawner when you enter a room the first wave of enemy spawns then when you've killed all of those every time one of them dies it'll send a signal back to its spawner when they've all died the next wave will happen and then for our agents, we're going to just get the navmesh agent components. For the time being, let's get rid of the update and start with our attack function, our troll function, and our chase function as well, which just for consistency's sake, capitalize these. And just as I do that, I forget that I'm actually going to switch between these states through void update. So we're actually going to uh, need to re-implement that one. Because we're going to need to check, obviously, every frame uh, whether or not uh, player 
in sides. For now, we'll just make that equals to false. We're going to uh, work with that a little later because we need to check if this is true, right? So we can use the physics check sphere and then we can use our own transform position for the enemy, the side range variable, and then our player layer. So that's only true if something that's on the player layer is within this range. And then we can just copy over that line of code and we can change this to attack range. And now we have these two bool variables filled out. Now that those bools are set, we can start working with um, assigning these states, right? So if the player insight is false, and then also we have no player in attack range, we will just have the enemy patrol, which actually, uh, since it's only there's one command I figured out the other day, uh, you can just do that. <laughs> and that works as well there's probably a lot of people watching this right now thinking you just realized yes i just realized that so now we can check whether or not the player is in side range uh but not in attack range and if that's the case we can chase and if player is in sight and player is in attack range we go to our attack function Actually, I think we might not need this one for patrolling. Uh, I, I've looked at a couple of different tutorials and some of them use something like this, others don't. What we're going to do instead is walk point set. This way we can know whether or not we have a destination we're walking towards at the moment. Because this destination point arrived boolean, we can literally just check our destination points and our transform position. I mean, vector3.distance is a thing we can use. So here we can check if um, walk point has been set. And then we, we can make a separate function for this, I suppose, to void search for walk point, where we set a float for z, and we also set a float for x, which will be random range. What was that variable called again? I forget. Walk range. So uh, that's minus walk range to walk range. And that's going to be the exact same thing for z or x, I mean, because we already did z. And then our destination point will be equal to a new vector 3. That is going to be equal to transform position, good enough for now, x plus uh, x, y will be, I suppose, the same. I just want to know if this works to begin with. Probably a good idea to check if this uh, destination point is actually over some ground or not. So uh, let, let's do that real quick. So we can do a physics raycast. We'll check the destination point and then transform. It's not transform down. Can we just do vector three down? I suppose we can do that, which wouldn't take its rotation and stuff into account. But I don't think that really matters. Uh, the max distance, like let's do five or something like that. Something small, but not too, <laughs> too small. And then uh, the ground layer for the layer mask. We're just going to check whether or not there's ground for now. Uh, if that's the case, we're going to set walk point set to being true because we found a good walk point. And then obviously, um, we already set the destination point. So if this is not being set to true, this entire thing will just happen again next frame. So if walk point set um, is false, that's what we were doing before, <laughs> we just search for walk point. And after that, we can obviously check if walk point is set. We can just say uh agent set destination destination point that's everything there is to it in theory and see whether or not this is going to result in issues which certainly doesn't seem to be uh to be moving quite yet does it it's moving now okay we, uh, we, we just have to smack it which 
It's probably because he was stuck in the floor. That honestly probably is the reason. Or, or is he just sliding? Yeah, no, he's just sliding off the platform. <laughs> uh, so again, this is the first time I'm working with these layer masks, so do give me a break. But I think I can just make a ground layer here. Uh, and then a player layer. And I can set you to being on the player layer, which also changed all of its children. That's fine. And then this will be set to the ground layer. These layer masks we're going to need to obviously um, also set. So in this patrol enemy, ground layer should be yeah, ground layer. There we go. And then the player layer will be player layer. And now it should only pick a navigable point in theory. It still won't start walking until I... Oh no, no, it starts walking. It starts walking. It just doesn't have anything to, to chase me with yet, I suppose. But you should now at some point stop walking. And yeah, you stop walking. You are rotating towards a new location, I'm assuming. And you're going to start walking to there at some point in the mid to near future. Oh, we're going to need to do so much debugging. <laughs> oh, I, uh, I forgot to do one very important thing. So the debugging thing is probably not that big a deal. Uh, I, I forgot something uh, relatively important. And that is, uh, obviously, we want a... While we're doing the patrolling, we're also going to want to um, check if Vector3 distance um, transform position, there we go, is less than, let's just say, 10. Then we set warp point set back to false. So it's moving to a new location. Apparently 50 units is still quite far, so a thousand was absolutely overkill. And then immediately it starts moving towards a new direction. Okay, so this uh, this motherfucker works. It's just the combination of physics and knockback doesn't work all that well. So yeah, it seems like probably the thing that's being fucked here is the fact that the navmash and your rigid body both have a velocity value and those are conflicting. So we can say navmash enabled equals false, which then will make it so that it can't walk altogether. But if we just disable it before we give it the knockback, in theory, at least it should have the knockback again. It does. We do need to put back its constraints though, because <laughs> it seems like that has, uh, at least in a Y, so I think the constraints need to just be locked on all axes here. Okay, that seems to work. Now it just needs to re-enable the navmash when it lands back on the ground. So hopefully this will just work. Enabled equals true. And by default, that sh it should be just enabled until I manually disable it by hitting it. Okay, the fucking thing works. It's fantastic. <laughs> I, I did see a little bit of uh, weirdness there, but... Oh, working enemy AI. Fantastic. Next time we can get working on some character models and animations for these things so that I can actually program in their attacks as well. That's amazing. It's losing interest, and then when I get close enough, it gets interested again, and it's losing interest. Okay, was as easy as that. Those two fucking lines of code fixed the entire issue. I spent about 35 minutes programming the patrol enemy script and then another 45 minutes troubleshooting that one fucking issue.